Thanks, Jesse. Uh, yeah, a guy named Joe Hart is getting baptized uh, today at 11 o'clock at that service. It's actually going to happen right at the end of the service. So if you're here, maybe you're sticking around for an adult class or children's class or small group meeting, feel free to just cut out near the end of that and come back in. We, we love it when the church can come together as a family to see and to celebrate baptisms. But we also recognize that's not always possible, which is why we want to try and share photos and things like that so that we can all be aware of what's been going on. Uh, I really am glad that you are with us here this morning as we transition into a new teaching series that we're going to be in during the month of November. Uh, so for the last couple of months, we were working through the Old Testament book of Genesis. And today, we're actually going to be uh, starting a new sermon series that, that builds on one of the key ideas that shows up in that book of Genesis. It's something about, it's really a, an integral part of what it means to faithfully follow Jesus in our world today. And to prepare for that, I'd love to invite you to turn with me in the Bible to Acts chapter 1, if you could. If it would help you for any reason, there are some red Bibles in those seats around you. You can grab one of those and turn to the page number there on the screen. Um, so in that Genesis series, one of the ideas we came back to time and time again was the idea that, that God picked one man, Abraham, and he said, okay, Abraham, through your family, through your descendants, I am going to reach out and I'm going to bless the world. I, I'm going to change everything, right? In fact, in, in the chapter 12 of Genesis and verse 3, it talks about how Abraham has been blessed, but he is going to, to be this agent of blessing, right? He's going to say, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And as we saw in that series, the way that promise ended up coming true was through the birth of Jesus Christ, right? He was in that family tree of Abraham. And as followers of Jesus, we believe it's through his life, his death, and his resurrection that really that, that blessing, that the difference can be made in the lives of all people everywhere, not just a few Jewish people living in first century Palestine. But now, being put back in a right relationship with God, that is an opportunity for all people everywhere. And that really invites us, I think, to ask a question. Okay, how do followers of Jesus, what's our part to play in all of that, right? If this idea is that people are blessed by God in order to be a blessing, what's our part in doing that, right? Because what was true for Abraham is also true for us. God didn't just bless Abraham because he really liked Abraham more than everybody else. He blessed him with the idea that he would sort of pass that blessing along. He would benefit other people. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus today, that, that same charge is on us. That's how we live out that part of the promise in Genesis 12, that we too have been blessed amazingly through what God has done for us. And we're called to invest that and to share that with other people, to help them also find the fullness of life that we have been privileged to find in Christ. So again, a big way that we're called to do that then is by telling other people about Jesus. Uh, you see that a number of times in scripture. So for example, in the bulletin today, we printed up Matthew 28. It's known as the Great Commission, and it says you know, you're supposed to go into all the world and make disciples telling people about Jesus. Uh, another great verse to look at is the one that I had you turn to in Acts chapter 1. So in Acts 1, what we see is basically some of the very last words that Jesus says to his disciples before he leaves the earth. And in chapter 1, verse 8, he says this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, right? There in Jerusalem, the city where they are, and throughout Judea, the, the area around them, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right? This is how we live out our part of that promise that we saw started in Genesis 12. It's by telling other people about Jesus. And that practice, which is often known as evangelism in churches, is a, a key focus for us here at Suburban. It's a key part of what we as followers of Jesus are called to do. Now, one of the things that we say up here at Suburban all the time is that our goal is to help every single person that we meet encounter Jesus and, and become fully alive in him, right? We want every single person that we meet to have an opportunity to meet Jesus and to begin to live the full and the free lives that they were created to live. And as we've thought about it, you know, in terms of where we put our time and energy and resources, in our experience, people who are really becoming fully alive are people who make intentional choices to engage in certain kinds of practices and rhythms and activities. And they're things that help them grow in what we call the three C's, right? Which is their relationship with Christ, their relationship with a local church, and then their relationship with the community around them. So under each of those areas, we have a couple of things that we put a lot of emphasis on around here. Because these are activities or practices that in our experience, right, this is where the most people get the most bang for their buck, right, in terms of connecting with God and really growing. So for all of us, we want people to come on Sunday mornings. We want people to engage in corporate worship of God. We're always encouraging people to develop personal spiritual practices. That's why we want you to read the Bible for yourself and pray if you're not doing that. 
Uh, we want people to connect with others here through a small group, whether that's a formal small group or an adult class or a team where they serve together or just you know, friends uh, gathering for lunch once every couple of weeks to encourage each other. We want people to identify their gifts and serve here. And then we also want people to take their gifts out and serve in the community. And we want people to engage in evangelism and sharing that with others. Because just in our experience, we found that people who are doing these kinds of things, who are committed to, to engaging in these things, it's something about when we do that, the Holy Spirit gets room in our lives to work. And that's what it looks like when people are becoming ever more fully alive in Him. And obviously, that idea of evangelism, telling other people about it, that is one of the things that we put a lot of emphasis on around here. And we encourage people to do that for a number of reasons. One, we encourage people to, to share their faith and to tell other people about Jesus, quite simply, because that's what Jesus clearly commands us to do, right? If we're following him, if he's the Lord and leader of our lives, we need to make an effort to do what it is that he wants us to do. And it's really clear he wants us to tell other people about him. Now, beyond that, we want to tell other people about him because we really do believe that can make their lives better. It can give them an opportunity to know him and to live the full free lives they were created to live. And then finally, we've just experienced in our lives that when we engage in this work of sharing about Jesus with other people, something in us becomes more fully alive as well. It's part of how God put this thing together that as we follow him in this step of obedience, he works in our lives too. So that's why we think it's important to tell other people about Jesus. Um, but here's the deal. I don't know if you all have had this experience or not, but that's really hard to do in the Pacific Northwest. Um, has anybody else ever experienced that around here? Oh, it's just me? That's good to know. Great. No, I, I think it's, there's some sort of unique challenges when it comes to talking to people about Jesus in the Pacific Northwest and in our valley in particular. I'll give you just one example of that. Uh, you all may not know this, but I have a superpower. It's true. My superpower is I can shut down conversations on an airplane just like this. Right? Like every time I'm flying into Portland, I always bring a book because inevitably this is what happens. Right, we get on the plane, it's like a three-hour flight from the Midwest out here. You sit down, you talk to the person next to you. They're from the Pacific Northwest. Well, where are you from? Oh, I'm in Corvallis. What do you do in Corvallis? Well, I'm a pastor in a church. <laughs> and they just don't want to talk anymore after that. You know, the earbuds go in, they grab a book, whatever it is. They're just not interested in having a conversation when they find out what I do. Or even beyond that, even as I've gotten to know people here in the community, in Philomath and Corvallis, oftentimes when I talk about what I do, there's, there's a real distance at first. Like, it's only after they get to know me that they'll say things like, you know, for a Christian, you're pretty normal. Which makes me think you really don't know me all that well if you think I'm normal, but we'll get to that later. Um, but has anybody ever had that kind of experience when they're sort of thinking about talking about Jesus? It just, it can be awkward in our valley for some reason. But it is part of what it means to follow Jesus. Part of what it means to follow Jesus is we're supposed to talk to other people about him. But when we try to do that, especially when we try to do that here, I get the sense that there's just this general sense of resistance that we often run up against. Uh, it's not often, at least in my experience, you all may have had very different experiences. I don't run into a lot of just outright hostility, you know, where you try to talk about Jesus and people just get downright angry and they don't want you to talk about it. For the most part, I just get this sense of resistance, right? Sometimes it shows up as indifference, kind of like, well, uh, you know, whatever, it's, there's no need for that in my life. But there's just almost this resistance. People don't even want to engage in the conversation. And when we experience that, when we experience that resistance, it can be awkward. It can make it intimidating to try to figure out, okay, well, if I'm supposed to talk about Jesus, how do I do that well? And I think, as I've kind of stopped and thought about it, I think that resistance that we feel, I think the root of that resistance can come from a number of different places. And one of those really is spiritual, right? As Christians, we believe that we do have an enemy, that there are forces of death and evil that are at work in this world that really don't want people to live the full free life that God has for them, that prefer it for people to stay trapped in cycles of depression or anxiety or slavery in different ways. And part of the resistance that we feel, I think, really does have that honest spiritual root to it. But beyond that, I think there's a lot of cultural forces at play at well. There's a real cultural resistance that we run into. And it's not an exaggeration to say that over the last 50 or 100 years, our culture has experienced some really dramatic shifts. I mean, one of those, and you see this on college campuses, for example, is a shift away from objective standards to truth to more subjective standards for truth, especially in areas like religion. You'll have conversations with people, and you'll often hear people say things like, well, that's true for you, but based on my experience, I found what's true for me, and just on my subjective experience, and I'm going with that. And even beyond that, like we, America, in North America, we are increasingly becoming a post-Christian culture. 
and by that I mean that 50 years ago, the, the Christian voice really enjoyed a place of privilege in the national conversation. It was just sort of assumed that we would have a voice at the table. But more and more, that's not the case, right? We don't automatically go into the conversation with some sort of social clout behind us with this assumed place of privilege. It's just not there. And even beyond that, for a lot of people in our culture, Christians are seen as anti-intellectual, anti-science, uh, focused on things that are irrelevant to real life, old-fashioned, and people who are so concerned about getting to heaven that they're really not contributing to the good of the people around them. And all of those cultural forces, they kind of pool in, and they're, they're one of those sources of resistance that we feel sometimes when it comes to telling people about Jesus. Um, and beyond that, beyond sort of the spiritual and the cultural, I, th I think there's another source of resistance that we've really got to be honest about. If we're honest, a lot of times, there's an internal resistance that we have when it comes to sharing our faith with other people. Now, this is just a guess, but my guess is that for some of you, when you sat down today and looked at a bulletin and realized, oh my gosh, we're going to spend a whole month talking about evangelism, there's like a little part of you that died on the inside. You're just like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, but that internal resistance, it can come from a number of different places. Uh, maybe it comes from the fact that like, we've seen evangelism done really poorly in the past, and we just sort of don't want to have anything to do with that. So, for example, my wife Martha and I, uh, we lived in Chile for a number of years. It was very, very common, even to this day in Chile, to walk down the street and really see people on street corners and in parks with megaphones, just kind of yelling at people about Jesus. Uh, so, for example, one time Martha and I, we were going through a park, and there was this teenage couple that was very obviously on a date on a park bench. And like six feet away, there's megaphone guy literally just railing about them, you know, like, oh, no, you're going to hell and da-da-da-da. You know, or when I was at Ohio State, when I was doing my graduate work at Ohio State, at the center of Ohio State's campus is the Oval. It's this big grassy area. And there was a guy that two or three times a week would come, literally, he brought his own box, and he would stand on it, and he would pick fights with people as they were walking by and, and try to really angrily argue them into a relationship with Jesus. And I think sometimes we've seen that happen, and we're like, well, I don't want to be that guy. Uh, you know, so there's this resistance that comes from that. Or sometimes that internal resistance really does come from fear. Right? Fear of being rejected, uh, fear uh, of being shunned by our friends or being seen as pushy or small-minded or judgmental. Um, we're afraid maybe that when we share with people, they'll say, wait, you believe that? I, I thought you were smart. Like, how can you believe those kinds of things? So that fear can be part of the internal opposition that we feel as well. Or maybe the opposition comes because we, we know that we should do this. In fact, we even want to do this because we have some people in our lives, our friends, our classmates, our coworkers, our neighbors, people that we feel like their lives would be genuinely better if they knew Jesus in the way that we know Jesus. But we just don't know how to start the conversation. Right? We, we've never seen a model of how to do that that is effective. So there's some resistance there because if you don't have a, a, an idea of where to start, you kind of resist the idea of starting. And all those things together, right? all those different sources of resistance, that, that come together, I think, to make talking about Jesus in our world very complicated. In fact, that's actually what kind of led us to the, the title that we're using in this series, which is the idea of talking about Jesus when no one wants to listen. Because I really do think that's the heart of the dilemma that we face. It is really clear from Scripture that we are supposed to talk to other people about Jesus. But for all the reasons that we've talked about today and more, in our valley, a lot of people just don't want to listen. And if I haven't convinced you that that is true, this is what I would challenge you to do this week. I would challenge you to go to Amazon and buy this t-shirt, okay? Put it on and go to your favorite coffee shop. You will have so much free time. I mean, you will have such great quality alone time. Uh, people will they'll, they'll give you some space for sure. So here's what we're going to do over the next few weeks in this series. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what we can do to tell other people about Jesus here in our valley in a way that doesn't seem pushy or it doesn't seem weird. And I want you to know that a lot of the ideas that I'm, I'm talking about today came from a sermon by a pastor named Gary Jones. He preached this up in Portland not too long ago. And someone shared a link of that podcast with me. And you know, every once in a while, as a pastor, I hear something that other pastors share, and I just think, oh my gosh, that lines up so well with what God wants to communicate to our congregation today. So I'm really grateful I had an opportunity to learn from him. And I'm really hopeful that the ideas we're talking about today can set the stage well for where we're going to be going over the next few weeks. Um, so to, to kind of tee this up, I want you to go to a different place in Acts now. So it's Acts chapter 16. So if you've still got Acts chapter 1 there, just flip forward a few pages and you'll be there. Um, but we're, as you're turning there, remember what we saw in Acts chapter 1. So Acts chapter 1 is a command, right? You've got to go and talk to people about Jesus. But it's also a promise, right? There's this promise 
that it's the Holy Spirit that's going to come and empower us, that's going to help us to actually do this. And what we see in Acts 16 is we see a, a story of an early Christian leader named Paul who basically lives his life taking Jesus at his word. He assumes that what Jesus says in Acts 1 and 8 is actually true, that the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be there. So as he's traveling around the Mediterranean basis, he's telling other people about Jesus, he just constantly relies on the power of the Holy Spirit to lead him and to guide him and help him live out that command well. And that's one of the key thoughts that I think we can pull from this passage. Uh, it's this idea that the Holy Spirit, right, God's empowering presence lives in people who follow him. And that Holy Spirit really can lead us in very practical ways as we engage in this work of talking to other people about Jesus. So we're going to look in the next couple of weeks at a model that we can use to think about how to do this, but this is the foundation. This is the thing that we can't forget or get away from. It all starts with the power of God living in us and working through us. So let me give you just an example of how that, that plays out. So chapter 16 starts out, and Paul and some of his companions are traveling through what we would know as modern-day Turkey. And they're, they're planning churches and towns, and then they're trying to go to different areas. And at one point, um, Paul is getting ready to leave one town, and he wants to go to a specific part of Turkey, which is known as Asia. It was called Asia back then, which is weird because we use Asia differently today. But anyway, there's a little part of Turkey called Asia back then. And just as he's about to go there, he feels that the Holy Spirit blocks him in that. So let's start reading this in verse 6 where he says this. It says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they then tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. Now, once you get past all of the names that it's really hard for us to pronounce, um, what you see is really clear. Right? God's got a plan, and Paul knows what the plan in general is. He's supposed to go to these churches, to these cities. He's supposed to tell people about Jesus, and he's supposed to start these local churches, these communities of Jesus followers there. But God didn't give him, like, the 30-point plan at the beginning. Instead, he just takes a step, and then he says, well, maybe I need to go over here. And either God says yes and leads him to do it, or God says no. So you start out, and he's there, and they're, they're, he wanted to go to Asia. But the Holy Spirit said, no, no, don't go to Asia. So instead they go through Phrygia and Galatia. So he gets over to Mysia and he's like, well, God is the next step to go to Bithynia? And it's kind of like, eh. you know, the Holy Spirit says, nope, don't do that. He says, well, okay, if we're not going that way, we'll go in the other direction. And they end up in the city of Troas. And the overall sense, right, is that God's got a plan, but Paul is very dependent on the Holy Spirit to lead him in the day-to-day the -day steps. That, okay, I've done that, but what's the next practical step that I take? And just... Think about how that translates to where we are today. Right? Our goal, right? part of the, this mission that we're called to be a part of, we want to see every single person in our valley have an opportunity to get to know Jesus and become fully alive in him. And that, that's a big task because there are a lot of people around us that don't know him. So for us, maybe we think, oh my gosh, you know, how do we even get from where we are to there? But we know that God has a plan, right? In fact, God's plan is what his plan has been all along. His plan is for people who know him, that's people like you and me, to go out and tell other people about him. His plan is to use local churches like ours and like these other churches, like Grace City that we prayed for this morning, to go and to share about Jesus here in our valley. Right? God doesn't look at the Willamette Valley and say, oh my gosh, I, I don't even know what to do. I don't even know where to start. Well, let me think about something here. No, he's got a plan in mind, and it's you, and it's me. And, and when we know that general plan, we can then trust that in the day-to-day -day reality, God's going to show us what step to take. Just as Paul was like, well, should I go over here? And God said no, and he's like, all right, well, I'll go over here. The very same thing can be true for us. So as we get started in this, what I want to encourage you to do is to just really try to be sensitive to how the Holy Spirit is leading you. Right? As a church, we pray to be sensitive to how God is leading us as a church. But I just want to encourage you to kind of keep your radar up for the ways that God may be leading you in, in really practical things on a day-to-day -day basis. And I often think about this in terms of, of nudges. Uh, you know, I, I have never in my life seen, like, you know, the hand of God come down and write on the wall or heard an audible voice from God, anything like that. But there are a lot of times in my life where I just, you know, I get an idea in my head that I don't really think is from me, or I get this, this nudging, right, this, this prompting to, to reach out to a person. You know, maybe it's somebody you haven't thought about in a little while. You know, or maybe you think, well, maybe I need to just swing by their office and say hi. Or, you know, I haven't seen that. Maybe on my walk today, I'm going to walk through that part of the neighborhood, and we'll just see if I run into that person so I can say hi to them or try to encourage them. Right? If we believe that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is going to lead us in this, 
then it really is worthwhile to, to keep our radar up for seeing ways that he may be leading us on a day-to-day -day basis. And I gotta tell you, I, I can't tell you how many times over the years I've, I've seen God do something when I've done that. Now, for sure, there have been a lot of times where I've felt God really nudging me, and I have just decided to ignore that, uh, either because I was scared or because I was too tired or I just really didn't want to. But the times that I've said, okay, God, I, I want to respond to how you're leading me, it's just really cool to see what he does. I mean, so, for example, not too long ago, I was, was in the office, and just this friend, that I, a guy that I've gotten to know here in the community, he came to mind, and I hadn't seen him in months. But I just thought, you know, maybe I just... I don't know, maybe this is from God. I'll just reach out to him. So I send him a little text message just saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. And, and you know how, like, sometimes you text people and immediately they start writing back. You see the little dots kind of on your phone. You're like, ooh. Like, immediately, didn't, didn't miss a beat. And immediately he wrote back and he said, is there any time that we could get together? And so we get together and we start talking. And it turns out he's just experiencing some really significant health challenges in his life. It's been really hard for him and for his family. And he just needed somebody to listen. He just needed somebody to talk with him and encourage him. And I, I look at that, and I really feel like it was God who orchestrated that. And that's kind of part of what we can learn from this example of Paul here. If we expect God to be leading us, and we keep our radar up, we're just going to become more aware of the way that he's nudging, the way that he's leading us. And if we respond to that, I just think we get to be a part of some things that are really, really cool. <laughs> So that's, that's one of the things that we remember in this. As we go through, it's the Holy Spirit that leads us. It's the Holy Spirit that leads us. Um, but I want us to keep reading in this passage because there's some other really interesting things that we see Paul do here. So let's, let's keep reading starting in verse 9. So Paul is in Troas, right? He's kind of awaiting his next orders. What, what's going to be next? So he says, During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia. Macedonia is kind of a part of northern Greece. So a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, said, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, uh, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I mean, it's just a powerful experience for Paul, right? He's, he's sort of there awaiting orders, and in the night he gets this dream, right, where this guy from Macedonia literally is like, Paul, you gotta, we need you. Come over here. Please come and work with us. And that dream is so vivid that like, the next morning they just immediately they pack up and they head over to Macedonia, and they begin to, to preach and to tell people about Jesus in the Greek city of Philippi. Now, if you were here with us this summer back in August, we preached through the book of Philippians, which is a letter that we have in the New Testament that Paul wrote to the church he ended up founding there in the city of Philippi. And at the beginning of that series, Jamie Mills was preaching, and he was talking a little bit about the city of Philippi itself, because it's kind of a unique place. Um, it wasn't the, the biggest city around. I think these are some of the ruins. You can still go visit Philippi today. Um, but it was really strategically located on a key road. And it was also a Roman colony. So a lot of the cities in Greece, you know, the Romans had taken over. Some cities were given this special status as being a colony of Rome. They were like little pieces of Roman real estate right there in the middle of Greece. So because of that, the people who lived there, they really enjoyed a, a privileged social status. So you think about the average person in Philippi. This is a person who on the outside looks like they've really got it all together. Right, they're living what seems to be a great life. They're in a great location at the crossroads of the world. And yet what we see in this dream is this man who seemingly has it all together on the outside, begging Paul to come, letting him know that he has a real need to hear the message of the gospel. Right, part of what I think God is trying to communicate to Paul there is that like, this guy looks like he's got it all together on the outside, but there's some real brokenness on the inside that can only be addressed by the message of the gospel. And when Paul sees that, when he realizes, boy, this guy looks like he's got it all together, but he needs God, it just creates this burden in him. I mean, just this overall sense, this passion, I have got to respond to this. I've got to go. And it's such a great burden. It says that they get up the next morning and immediately they pack up their stuff, right? Like, we can't wait even a day to do this. We've got to go and begin to talk to them about it. And I think that the vision, I think it was so compelling to Paul because I think what he saw in that vision was this picture of what was really going on on the inside of this man from Macedonia. It, he seemed like he had a lot going for him there in Philippi, but God knew there was brokenness below the surface. And you know, that's a real lesson for us today. Because just look around us. Look around us. Right? In a lot of ways, we're Philippi. I mean, we really are. We live in a strategic place. Right? Because of the university and the companies that are here, literally, the world is at our doorstep. And a generation of leaders come into this valley to be trained and then to go out into the world. 
mean, we live in such a beautiful place. I was thinking about this morning as I was driving in. You know, just, it is an amazing place to live, just in terms of natural beauty, and we have access to so many amazing things around us. So it's so easy to look around at people and think, man, people here, they are living the good life. And you know, in many ways they are. But we all know, we all know people who seem like they've got it all together on the outside, but are pretty broken on the inside. On the inside, they're still lonely. They're still anxious, right? They're still hurting. You know, they've got a nice house and a good education and a good job and one of those annoying families where like every kid is above average and they're all gonna go to Ivy League schools and they don't need braces and all that kind of stuff. But when you get to know them, you open up, like you just realize they're just a mess below the surface. You know, we know that you can have it all in the world's eyes and still be miserable, right? And, and that's, I think, what Paul got a picture of in, uh, in what was going on in Philippi. And in that vision, God broke Paul's heart for people who are living that way. And he just got this increasing burden to drop everything and go and to tell them about Jesus. And again, we can learn from Paul. All right, a second step that we can take in this journey of telling other people about Jesus is that we can begin to pray that God would give us that same kind of burden for our community. That God would never let our hearts be cold to the people in our valley who seem like they've got it all together on the outside, but really don't because they do not know Jesus. So here's the thing, if you're a follower of Jesus and you have never prayed this specific prayer, this is what I wanna challenge you to do. I wanna challenge you every day this month to just pray that God would give you a burden for the people around you who don't know him. That's kind of an old-fashioned, like, 18th century churchy word, like my grandma would use, well, she wasn't from the 18th century. How does she? No, she's 97, so I had to do the math, okay? But no, she would talk about that, about how God would just give her a burden for people. So it's kind of an old-timey word, but it, it's one that's got some weight, right? It's that idea that, that God opens up our eyes to see the reality of the lives of the people around us. And he gives us this weight this burden that we carry for them, this desire to see God do something in their lives, to see the life-changing message of Jesus come and make a difference for them. So if you've never done that before, I would commit you to pray, to pray every day this month that God would give you that kind of burden and just see what God does in your heart. Because think about it, right? We talk a lot up here at Suburban about being for the valley. Right? It's what we wanna be known as as a church, which is why we're engaged in a lot of things in our community. Because being for the valley does mean meeting real practical needs in our community, right? So we partner with Love, Inc. in the work that they do to help people who are hungry find food and jobs. We partner with DHS uh, to, to work on the broken foster care system in our county. But if we're really for the valley, we can't just be about those external things, right? If we are really for the valley, like we've got to be about God doing that work in the hearts of people as well. Because our valley needs healing in the things that we can see and the things that we can't see as well, right? If we are really passionate about God's good work for this valley, we have to be passionate about seeing God heal individual hearts as well. And that's what we see here, right? It's God gives, uh, the, the Holy Spirit leads us, and then the Holy Spirit really does give us this burden, this, this passion for other people to know him. But if you read through the rest of this chapter, what you also see is that the Holy Spirit empowers the things that we do, and it's his power that draws people to him. So there are a number of different stories in the rest of this chapter where Paul reaches out to people in different ways to share about Jesus with them. And the author just goes out of their way each time to highlight that while Paul is playing his part, it's really the power of God that's doing the work in their lives. So for example, a few verses later, Paul's talking, he's using his words, he's talking to a group of people about Jesus. And it says that a woman named Lydia listened, as she was listening, the Lord opened her heart and she accepted what Paul was saying. Right? Paul's the one doing the speaking, but it's God who opens up her heart so that she can respond to those words. Or check this out, a few verses later, there's a, a story where, where Paul encounters this young slave girl who has this evil spirit in her, and that spirit gives her the ability to, to sort of tell fortunes, to predict the future. Well, her masters see this as a real cash cow, right? So they're like, hey, I can sell her to people, you know, so she tells her fortunes. So she does all that, and they're making money off of her. But at some point, she recognizes that Paul has the spirit of God in her. And she starts following him around, sort of saying, hey, this guy's got the spirit of God in it. And Paul, I think partly because he's just annoyed at this person saying this all the time, and partly because he doesn't want to see this little girl enslaved to the spirit anymore. He wants her to live the full free life God created her to live. This is how he shares Jesus with her. He turns to her at one point and says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it instantly did. 
Now, again, from our modern worldview, this, this seems strange and it seems miraculous. And, and even if you're here today and your worldview doesn't make space for miracles, um, what I would encourage you to do is try to see what the author is trying to communicate here. Maybe just set that to the side for a second. Because what the author is trying to communicate here is that it's not Paul who made this possible. Paul did his part, but it is the power of God that delivered this little girl. Right? Over and over again in this chapter, you see the author try to explain that. We have our part to play, but it's the Holy Spirit that empowers this work and truly brings about change in people's lives. And, and when it comes to this work of evangelism that we're called to do, that's what we need to know. It's the Holy Spirit that leads us. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us a burden, and it's the Holy Spirit that then empowers us to do it. But I think even if you know that, even if you feel like, okay, this is something that I need to do, if you're not sure how to go about it, like still you may be like, ah, how do you start? Right, so a question that I think is very legitimate for us to ask today is this. Is there a way to talk about Jesus that isn't pushy, judgmental, disrespectful, unloving, cheesy, superficial, and weird? Um, the good news is the answer to that question, I think, is a resounding yes. Um, so what we're going to do, does somebody say yes? <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> if I said no, it would be a really short sermon series. Um, but so what we're going to do over the next couple of weeks is kind of teach our way through a model of how to do this, how to about talk about Jesus in our world today that really is rooted in what we see Paul doing here in Acts 16. Um, this is a model that we've seen some other churches use and talk about, and they call it the BLESS model. Now, BLESS is an acronym, and I, I did just say that there's a way to do this without being cheesy, and my personal thought is that most acronyms are cheesy, so I apologize for that. So the, the name is a little cheesy, but the model is not. The model, I think, is really a very helpful way to begin to have conversations with people about spiritual things um, that isn't off-putting and, and that really can be effective in the world that we live in. So let me just kind of walk you through it real quickly, and then we'll finish up our time together. But it, each of those letters is one of the steps, right? So for B, we begin with prayer, right? We begin with prayer. If you've been part of Suburban for any length of time, like, you know that prayer is a big part of what we do. We've got it written on the walls in a number of places around here. Pray first. So again, part of what we do is we want to begin with prayer. That we pray that God would open up our eyes to the people around us and, and what's really going on in their lives. That God would help us know the people that are maybe already in our sphere of influence that need to know him. We pray that God would give us that burden, that passion for sharing with them about Jesus. And then we pray that as God leads us, he would open up opportunities to have conversations with them. And then from there, we listen. Right? We actually just take the time to listen to what's going on in people's lives. It is amazing how often uh, we get together with people and they never ask us a question. Right? They just want to talk because people want to be heard. Right? So part of what we can do to really care about people is just listen to what's going on in, our li in their lives. And then beyond that, one of the things I think you can really do is to eat with people. There is incredible power in sharing coffee with someone or sharing a meal with someone. It's a way to deepen friendships and to really invest significant time in a person's life to get to know them. Those meals tend to deepen relationships in ways that few things can. And then from there, as we have opportunities, we serve them. Maybe we find out a, about a need that's going on in our lives, and we actually serve them with our time, with our, our energy, with our resources. And then, as God gives us opportunities, we share our story with them. Right? We share what it is that God has done in our life. We share the difference that it has made in our lives. I mean, it's really that simple. Right? We do that, and we trust that through it all, it's God's Holy Spirit uh, that will draw people to him, opening up their hearts and their minds. There's one last uh, important thought to keep in mind as we do this. I could easily see how somebody, maybe there's somebody's here today and they're, they're sort of exploring Christ for themselves. They're not sure what they believe about all this. And they're like, well, hold on a second here. You've got a system for how to have a conversation with somebody? Is this like just, are you just trying to rack up converts and you're trying to like rack up points for Team Jesus here? I mean, isn't this just turning people into projects? Like they're projects to be conquered and brought into the kingdom. Um, I could see how people would look at it that way. But I really think the answer to that question is no. Like, we're not motivated to do this because we're trying to sort of run up the score for our team. We're motivated to do this because of love. Like, when you stop and think about it, the central command that Jesus gave every single person that followed him was you need to love other people, right? He says, they're going to know you are my followers by the way you love each other. We're called to love our neighbor as ourselves. And here's the question. If we really do believe that Jesus has transformed our lives, right, if our lives are better because Jesus is a part of it, the most loving thing that we can do is let other people know that. Because if there are other people in your life that you care about that you don't want to talk about with Jesus with them, but they don't have him in their lives, 
really what you're saying is, I've got this thing that has changed every aspect of my life for the better, but I don't want you to have it. Like, I don't love you enough to, to embrace the awkwardness of starting a conversation to let you experience that too. I remember a few years ago, I saw a video um, from, it's either Penn or Teller, you know, the two musicians, the one who talks, I think it's Penn. But basically he was saying, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in Christianity, I don't believe in any of that stuff. But how much do you have to hate non-Christians if you don't want to tell them about Jesus, right? I mean, if you really believe that this can change your life, why wouldn't you want to tell me about it? I'm going to say no, but I at least respect the fact that you want other people to know about it because it makes me think you actually believe that it's true. Um, so that's really what the motivation comes down to. It really is coming down to what does it look like to love? Because if we really do love people, we're going to hope that they're going to meet Jesus and experience him in the same way that we have met Jesus and experienced him. And you know what? Even if they never respond to his offer of love and grace and forgiveness, you know what we're going to do? We're going to keep praying for him, keep listening to him, keep eating with him, keep being in a relationship with him because Jesus doesn't want us to be jerks to people, right? I mean, he wants us to love other people and continue to engage with them. So please, as we talk about this model, don't see this as, as like a, a formula that is guaranteed to make converts to the faith. Instead, it's really just a simple way to guide our thoughts and actions so that we can love other people in the best way possible. Um, so while we'll spend a couple of weeks really working through this model, this is where I want to encourage you to start today, right? In your interactions with the people around you, start with love, right? Start with generous love. Love people with what you do. Uh, commit to being the kind of person who changes the reputation that Jesus has in our valley. Uh, commit to loving and encouraging and caring for the people in your circles around you so that you become the very first Christian that they like. Because that, that could be the case for some people. Because people need somebody to love them, not just preach at them. They need somebody who can interact with them in a way that respects where they are, but is also committed to loving them and being a great friend to them, even if they never choose to follow Jesus. Right? This model is not a guarantee, but it is a framework that we can all use to try to do what it is that God is calling us to do which is to share his amazing love with this amazing valley. Um, so this month, let's keep our eyes and our minds and our hearts open to ways that we can learn more about how to do that uh, and invite his spirit to help us actually go and do that work. So to that end, would you pray with me? God, thank you. Um, thank you for the truth that we see in your word. All right? From the very first few pages of the Bible, this idea that, that we have been blessed to be a blessing. Uh, and God, it's, it's super clear, right? One of the ways that you want us to do that is by sharing about you with other people. Um, but that is not always easy to do here. Uh, yeah, there are some people, Lord, and they're more extroverted or they have a strong gift of evangelism. And the easiest thing for us to do is to say, well, let's just outsource this to them, right? As a group, we're still getting that work done. And yet, God, every single person here has relationships with people that others don't have. You know, there's 55,000 people in this town, and no single one of us knows all of them. You know, but between the, the hundreds of people that call suburban home, we know an awful lot of them. So help us, Lord, know what you're calling us to do, what, what our part in this mission is, not our collective part as a church, but the way that you want each of us individually to be involved in this. And God, I admit that this is hard for me. I'm introverted, and I don't like awkward conversations. But God, you loved me enough uh, to reach out to me and to bring me back to you by your grace. And all you ask in return is that we share that love with others. Uh, so would you help me, Lord, know how to do this well? And for each of us that's here, Lord, would you just help us know, okay, what does it look like for us to engage in this work of telling other people about you, even when they don't want to listen? Um, because that is a dilemma, but it is a problem that we we can address as your spirit leads us. So as we prepare to close our time together today, Lord, I just pray that you'd help each of us know just a simple step that we can take this week to begin to share your love with others in a way that they can hear. Amen.